Last week, uh, we started a new sermon series here called Live on Purpose. This is uh, about a six-week series that we're walking through God's Word, particularly in the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is in the middle of your Bible, and it's God's wisdom, God's practical wisdom of, uh, of, of how do we live in God's world and experience his favor and his blessings in his world. He's got particular ways in which we can experience that. So since it's God's world, he has his ways for us to follow and live within to experience his blessings in this world, it's even though it's a broken, sinful, messed up world. We're walking through in this sermon series various Proverbs here in terms of how do we experience God's abundant life through his direction, living on purpose. I'm going to pause here before continuing because I'm just remembering something real quick. We have a birthday in the house that I wanted to acknowledge. One of our young ladies, Araceli Valle. How old are you turning today, Araceli? Ten years old. So I told Araceli on Wednesday night I would sing happy birthday to her. So this is your birthday song. It isn't very long. Hey. All right. <laughs> happy birthday, Araceli. And to anybody else who has their birthday today. As you can probably gather, we're not a very traditional church here. We love each other and we love Jesus. We break some rules as well in the meantime. Well, in today's message, as we walk through God's word, living on purpose, I'm going to be in Proverbs, as you saw on the screen there, Proverbs 21, verse 5, as well as Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. We'll kind of be working around those, those verses here today. In this sermon series, Live on Purpose, one of the things that he set out last week, for those of you who weren't here last week, uh, one of the things we set out last week is we're, we're all created for purpose, and we all live for a purpose, but we're not necessarily intentional in, in doing that, in expressing that. We have these things that drive us. We were, we were made for a purpose, and a purpose gives us definition, gives us direction, gives us identity. It, it, it trickles down into the everyday life of our decisions. Most of us are reacting. Reacting out of, out of good desires, maybe part of our personality, but these are things that are not ultimately our purpose, whether it's in terms of achievement or, or, or out of uh, uh, excellence or, or uh, 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 for, for productivity or we, we might live for our job or for... For even family is a good thing, but that's not the ultimate thing, because even that can corrupt us. Some of us are driven by our past. We're just repeating the script of brokenness in our families, and that drives us. Some of us are just living out our, our brokenness, our shame. God has given us a purpose. We can't rely on just our instincts and, and just finding purpose within ourselves. There's the philosophy of our culture today of you be you and, and you live out of your experience and you're the source of truth. We can't trust that because we're broken. Be, 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 because we're weak. Because we're, we're not whole and healthy. Because we're not objective. We're, we're not unbiased. We, we can't be trusted to be true and consistent in every way, shape, or form. We need a rock of a purpose that doesn't change, that, sh that gives us security in our identity, but also gives us security in character, that guides us in the decisions that we make, though things get tough. God has given us that person. We are created beings, and God has given us that purpose. And that's what we set out last week in, in realizing and receiving God has defined us and he's given us a clear purpose of loving him and loving others. There are other ways to express that. But we want to be intentional in receiving that, so we've got to keep that in front of us. We've got to be intentional. In Britain, they do a lot of weird things. Like, they have these cheese roll races down hills that are ridiculously steep and people break bones and they do it every year because it's I guess. 
One of the things that they do over there is these uh, um, horse costume races, pantomime horse costumes. You know, you got a person in the back and a person up front, and and uh, uh, just kind of like you know, we had the Kentucky Derby. Well, they've got uh, the horse costume races, and so they uh, they line them up and they uh, they blow the horn and then they they go. And as you can imagine, it's 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 absolutely hilarious. And uh, you know what what's one of the parts that I think is really funny is, of course, when the front and the back get separated. And uh, as you can see, in the case of uh, said brown horse on the right, we've, they've got a problem. <laughs> the, the head of the horse and the rear of the horse are not together. They are not aligned. In life, we have the desire of what we want to be, what we call aspirations. We aspire to be this. We, we want to, God's purpose to be our purpose. We have aspirations, then we have our actions. And too often, our, what we aspire to and how we live don't align. J- just like this, this, this horse costume race here, Oftentimes, we find ourselves, our aspirations and our actions don't line up. So how, how do we experience that? God's word gives us wisdom and how we can experience that. He's given us a purpose, but our lives can match that. It's not just something that we can hope for, holding on by a thread, but yes, our lives line up. That's through something as simple as planning. It may not seem as like really deep and theological, but it's very practical and powerful, and it's from his word. Aligning our aspirations and our actions in life requires planning. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we need you to open our hearts, not just to your word, but, Lord, to the willingness to, your, to follow your ways, to be changed. Lord, as we walk through your word and receive practical insight today, Lord, we, we acknowledge that, and I acknowledge from the very get-go here, we need your power to realize your purpose. So, so God, open our hearts to receive your wisdom, but Spirit, we need your power. We need your power to intervene to, that we can live this good news out. And Spirit, I need you to work in me, this sinful, weak, and broken vessel. Come upon me to speak your truth. In your name we pray. Amen. As I mentioned, last week, we talked about God's given us a purpose, but we need to intentionally keep God's purpose in front of us because our instinct is to pursue anything else. We need to acknowledge this point right at the get-go. Our tendency is to go anywhere else. Last week's verse was uh, uh, Proverbs 29, 18, where there's a lack of God's uh, revelation, God's vision, we cast off restraint. But there's blessing for those who follow the law of the Lord. We need God's purpose, God's vision in front of us. Today's passage says this, Proverbs 21, 5. The plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes to poverty. Let's break this down. It's, it's, it's pretty plain and clear at the offset, but the, what these, this, this, the, the, the author here is getting at, those who are diligent are those who approach life with a sense of responsibility, with self-discipline, and with a sense of it's going to require some grit and some hard work. That I'm submitted, I, if I'm going to follow God's ways, I'm going to let God's ways direct me. And with, with discipline, with self-control, I'm going to structure God's ways into my life. This word for planning is, is, is devising, calculating. It's a strategic kind of process of thinking. This isn't by happenstance. 
Now, how many times do we all, often us, we get caught up in the desire to change and we're like, George, zap me. Like, Jesus, just, just change me. Like, I, I just want to, I want to stop eating the bad stuff. Like, just make me just not like it. Like, make, make sugar taste nasty. Change me, Jesus. Like, zap me. Let, we kind of want, we're in this passive kind of sense of like, I want change to happen to me. But change is this cooperation with God and us. It requires us responding to God's work. It requires self-discipline. It requires hard work. We've got to come to grips with this reality. The, 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 the flip side of this, though, is everyone who's hasty comes to poverty. The hasty person, again, is that wants quick fixes, doesn't want to put in the work, takes shortcuts. Like, I want results, and I want it now, and it's more concerned about the results, whereas the diligent understand it's about the process. The process is part of the result. If we are going to experience God's goodness and God's ways cultivated in life, we got to join God in his work with intentional planning. I've got a little illustration here. All right, so today we don't have Grace Kids, but we've got, uh, I've got a special illustration I want to invite the kiddos to come up here and join and help me with. At the same time here, we're gonna, we've got a handout for both the kiddos and the parents here. Maybe we'll do the handout here right after the illustration. Uh, but I want you to get that ready, wherever Pastor Jose is and Ron. I want to have those handouts ready there after the illustration. So come on up on stage, kiddos. I need your, I need your help here. All right. So I, in order for others to see, I think I'm going to have you guys sit down. Can you guys sit down? Here, I'll pull this back here a little bit. All right. Here we go. All right, so I've got these different jars here. I've got some rocks. I've got some sand. I've got some big rocks, little rocks, and the sand. So, so this represents the amount of, of like time that we have. You know, we've got, all got a fixed amount of time. Some of us like to magically think that maybe we can like, you know, add more time. But anybody figure that out? Anybody be able to add more time to their day? Anybody? No. Some of us just do the Red Bull and the five-hour energy, and that's how we try to add time to our day, right? And we last so long. So we've got only so much time in our day in our, and, and, and in our life there, and we've got these different aspects of life, things that are like, you know, not necessarily super important, you know, like, um, I know this is going to, this, this, this might hurt here, but video games, they're not a big rock. They're not your priority. They're kind of like the sand. Video games are not super important. Yeah, I know. Your parents probably are very grateful that I'm sharing this with you right now. <laughs> all right? But so we've got all these different things in our lives that, that are not super important, uh, but we fill it with our lives, whether it's, you know, with social media or, or with, uh, uh, with checking our ESPN or binging on whatever Hulu, Netflix, dingy, uh, dingy. Disney Plus, not Dingy Plus. Well, it may be Dingy Plus. I don't know. I got political. Watch out. All right. So um, we only got so much. And these are the things that are, that are not so important, but they fill up our life. All right. So do you guys think, can we get all of this in here? What do you guys think? Cade's like, no. Heck, oh, we got a lot of shaking heads here. So, so if we take oftentimes when we live and just we're reacting to life, uh, we let the things that are not so important uh, take up time in our life, right? And we just, we just give in to these things. Maybe it's, it's texts and, and, and that don't need to be responded to immediately and, and uh, 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 entertainment kinds of things. And then there's things that might be, might be urgent, things in life that feel like, oh, they're pressure and crisis, uh, 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 but we have a hard time discerning between whether this urgent thing is actually important, but because it's urgent, we just feel like we should do it. Do you, do you ever have any things like that? I'm sure adults, you feel that, right? We feel that. And then we've got our priorities. We've got the things that are really important to us in life, like, like our family, like, like, like growing and becoming like Jesus. And, and, and 
we try to, to, to then fit these things that are the most important things in our life after we're just kind of surviving and we're just reacting to things. And, and all of a sudden, we can't, we can't fit it all in. And we find ourselves trying to cram the most important things in or find ways, but they get left out. Whether it's taking care of ourselves, whether it's taking care of our family and growing in Christ, these things end up getting left out because we're just reacting to life. Well, in the scriptures, God gives us a principle. Seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be added to us. Jesus is talking about there's anxious things in our life that we feel like, oh, I need, I need to respond to right now. I, my, what, what I think are physical needs or, or then there's the material things in this life that we, we pursue and we think are our purpose, but they're not. And, and he says, seek first the kingdom and everything else will be added to you. Well, let's try this a different way. Let's try this God's way. where we put our priorities, the most important things, we, we put these things in our life first. These are, you know what? We need to grow in Christ. We're going to have some family devotions. Um, we, we need to live on a budget to honor God's way of finances, so we've got to make sure we live within our means, so we've got to structure that. We want to be healthy, and then we, we can discern, like, oh, those urgent things, which ones are actually kind of important things? And we can put things in their place in life because we're doing it intentionally. And then we can fill in the gaps in life with the stuff that's not urgent, not important, but they're enjoyable, maybe. And all of a sudden... What do you guys notice is happening? What's happening, Sadie? Things become filling up. It's filling up. Wow. Did you guys hear what Sadie said? <laughs> that when you do the most important things, you have time to do what you want as well. Did we fit it all in there, guys? Yeah. We did. Because we followed God's principle, seek first the kingdom. Seek first his purpose and his priority. We got to intentionally do that first. But naturally, we let the little things in life dictate our time. We let the urgent things in life. We don't know if they're important or not, but they're urgent. And then we don't have time for the most important things. Thank you guys so much for your help today. You can go back to your seats. big rocks. The big rocks are our priorities. The big rocks come from our purpose, putting God's purpose first. This isn't something that naturally happens. We've got to acknowledge that. If it doesn't naturally happen, it requires us to be intentional and disciplined. I'm going to have the, uh, um, our crew hand out some, uh, some handouts here. Today's message is going to walk through how do we structure, how do we plan, how do we be intentional about keeping God's purpose first in our life, and how does this lead to living it out in our everyday life? How do we, how do we structure it? How do we plan? How do we plan? So today's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be much more practical in its application of Proverbs 21.5. In Matthew 6, 33, it's going to be kind of like a workshop today, okay? A little bit of, quite a bit different than one of our typical sermons here. So this handout I'm, I'm giving you all is to allow you to be able to follow along and do this work. If, you're, if, you're, if you don't get one of the handouts, we have a lot of extras here on the other part. So raise your hand if you didn't get a handout and you'd like to. So we've got a couple in the back there. So while they're handing these out, 
some basic outline here of what we're going to be walking through. What's included in planning? What's included in planning God's way? We need to clarify our purpose. We're going to personalize our purpose with values. God has made us each unique and different, and we express God's purpose in unique ways. Then we need to create specific goals and how we're going to live this out. We're going to start with what we call who goals, and then we move to do goals. Because what we do is determined by who we are. And then we're going to conclude here with, we've got to schedule it into our daily life. We've got to schedule this into the rest of our life. So let's jump in here, walking through this process, all right? Starting with purpose. Now, as Jesus summarized, what's the law and the prophets, everything in the, in the scriptures, how do you bring it all together? He said, love God and love others. Now, a lot of other people have described in different ways what is our purpose as human beings. There's the Westminster Catechism that says the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Our mission statement as a church is to know Christ, become like him and make him known. There's different ways to express these truths of loving God and loving others. As you take some time, this process of planning is going to take time in fleshing this out. You might personalize this in, in, a, in, in, in your own words. But for the, today's sake, in order to have a concrete example, we're going to use that statement from Jesus, that summary of loving God and loving others to flesh this out. We exist, this is a true statement from God, from his word, we exist to love God and love others. Or I exist to love God and love others. Now, you guys can be constructing this as a family, or maybe you're doing this as, as individuals or as singles. I'm try I, ho I hope to attend to both scenarios. So we've got the general purpose. This is true for all of us. But, but we are all unique. And we express God's purpose and, and, and vision in unique ways because he's made us in unique and different ways. And so the next step then is identifying what are some of the values that God has given us in terms of the unique ways that he's wired us or the, th the things that are important to us? What are the different ways, the things that we value? On the back of your sheet, your hand out there, you've got a list of different values. On the screen, I've got a few examples for those of you who are joining us online. It might be adventure, excellence, helping others, hospitality, generosity, truth. The Barber family, as we talked through this with our boys, things came out with us where we like food. No surprise. Last week, we talked a little bit about that, but we like good, foreign, creative, artsy food. That's something that uniquely shapes us. We value education, doing things well. We value, we, value, we value being together as family. We value adventure, helping others. We value healthy living and creativity. These are things that uniquely shape the Barber family. What are some of the things that uniquely shape you or that uniquely shape your family? Take a moment, just a couple seconds here, and just kind of look through that list and maybe mark off, circle a couple that maybe jump out to you. Talk with your kids next to you and ask them, what are some of the values or what, what are some of the things that, are, that, that you see are important to us as a family? We're not going to have time to completely flesh this out, but we're just going to get some things started here this morning. This is going to be, like we talked about last week, there's homework, well, or what I call home fun, because it's not work, it's fun, amen? I, there was more grumbling than, uh, than an amens out there. A side note here, friends, I, you can't rely on me to be passionate enough, powerful enough, for this moment to change you. What I do in preaching and teaching, this isn't enough. We have to respond. We have a responsibility. If we're going to let Jesus change us, we got to take it home. Every, every Sunday, 
we've got to apply this to our lives. It's really important. Otherwise, we're not going to experience the change God has for us. So values. Identify some of those values. Clarify that. We exist to love God and love others through adventure, through doing things well, through generosity, and helping others. Whatever those values may be. Now we're going to get into a little bit more specifics of, okay, what does this begin to look like? This is still kind of in a, in a very generic and, and abstract kind of form at this point. Let's begin to look at goals, priorities, breaking this down into more tangible ways. Now, when we set goals, oftentimes what we do is we set goals for things that are results. I want to lose 20 pounds. We're, and, 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 and oftentimes that becomes part of the problem because our goal misses some integral steps in between that lead us to the kinds of internal change and practical needs that we have in order to accomplish our desired results. When we establish goals, the scriptures uh, uh, explain for us or show us that what we do is determined by who we are. Who you believe you are, what you believe about yourself determines what you do. You know that to be true in your life. And a lot of times we live out some of our family patterns and shame and, 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 and we just repeat cycles over and over of, of I'm a failure, I'm a, I, I'm a loser, I'm, a, I'm an unwanted. Uh, and we live out these scripts because that's what we believed about ourselves. And so we self-sabotage in our life. We give up when things are hard because, I, oh, there it is, I'm a failure. And we reinforce it. Who we believe we are determines what we do. In Colossians 3, Paul gives an example of this. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Do you hear the who goal there? Who you are. You are chosen. You are loved. You are holy. You are set apart from the rest of the world. Clothe yourselves. Here's the do the do goals that come out of that. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That list continues on. There's so much more that, that's implied in terms of what it means. If, if, if I am loved by God, if, if, if I am chosen by God, if I'm saved, if I'm set apart, I'm not that old person anymore, there's a new person inside of me. There's, there's different kinds of behaviors that come from that. Your who goals determine your do goals. So let's look at this here. Who goals. I statements based upon your purpose and values. I statements based on your purpose and values. I am loved by God. Implied in we exist to love God and love others. Implied within that is that we are loved by God. We heard that in just that Colossians passage. That's important for us that we don't overlook that. I am loved by God. I love God and I love others. Now, when I just begin to just take, just, just think with me here and take a moment, just consider in the domains of life that you have, whether it's home or work or school or friends, when we begin to think, I'm a person who loves God. In this place at work, what does it look like for me? I love God. I'm a, I'm a man who loves God. I'm a woman who loves God. What, is that, what, is that, what does that mean? I love others. How does that begin to shape then how I see my actions? I'm a person who loves others. I'm loved by God. How does that begin to shape then how I interact and engage with, again, my family, my workplace? When we keep these things in front of us, these are the things that we repeat over and over. I am. This is who I am. Now, we don't live it perfectly, right? We're like, oh, that's, th 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 this is where shame and the enemy can come in and, and say, well, oh, oh, you failed again. And this is, this is one of the biggest things that keeps us from changing in life is, is being caught up in the shame game, of focusing on what we do rather than who God has made us to be. We've got to keep that in front of us. I am loved, I love God, 
and I love others. We got to keep that. That's the mantra. That's the thing that needs to be a hamster on the wheel in our minds every day. This is who I am in Jesus Christ. Now, this breaks down even into more practical ways. And let me just go back to, let's go back to that slide, just one more thing. This is really powerful for families because parents, as you talk with your kiddos too, this begins to frame your conversations. This is who we are as a family. Why, why don't we criticize or make fun of other people? We're, we, because we're a family who loves others. Why, why do we make, 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 make coming to, to church and growing in Christ or, or family devotions, why do we make this a priority? Because we love God. We're a family that loves God. The, when, when we create this script in our homes, we create this script for our children in their identity, in their mind, in their thoughts. So let's go to the next slide here. So we move to the do goals here. Now, what I, what I recommend is you guys start this. You take one thread, all right? One particular area where like, I'm loved by God or I, I love God, I love others or we love others, and then follow this out through the application. I'm going to give you a variety of different examples to show how this can apply to different areas of life. But as you start this, so you don't get overwhelmed because you can quickly do so, take one area of life and walk this through to its practical end. So for example here, in terms of do goals, do goals, as we break it down, these become goals that are specific and actionable and timely. We spell these out. We look at them in the roles where, where we live our life. We, we need to uh, specifically identify what are, what are the actions, the practices that reflect these goals. We need to ask our quotes, ourselves, what are the needs? What are the needs involved in order for me to accomplish this goal? And then we got to schedule it. It needs to be scheduled in our lives in some way, shape, or form. Now, we're going to walk through these things. Roles first. So as I suggested earlier here, as we consider, what does it look like for me as, as a person, as I approach this day or this week, what does it look like for me to love God at home with my family? What is that going to look like? And I begin to think about what are the kind of behaviors what are the kind of actions and attitudes? What does that begin to form in me? And you just begin to reflect and just, tear, just break this down. What does that look like? And you just kind of just begin freely writing just the different things that come up. What about at work or at school with our, with our classmates and with our teachers? What does it look like for me to love, if I love God at school? Or if I love God in my work? What does that look like in my work ethic? What, what, what does that look like in in how I use my time and my gifts. What about in the community or with our friends? Oftentimes with our friends where we become a person that we wouldn't otherwise be, where we hold it together in certain spaces and then we let things out with our friends that isn't consistent with our purpose. What does it mean to love God in, in my athletics, in, in the activities I'm involved in in the community, in the committees that I'm a part of? And how about what does it mean for me to love God in our church? What are the kind of actions and behaviors that, that come from that of demonstrating this, this is what it looks like for me to love God? where I come and I, I make this a priority to worship. I want to be in community with other believers. I want to grow. I need to be in the word together with other believers. I want to serve. These are things, ways that I express my love for God at church. So we look at the different roles that we play as, and, and, and take our who goals and apply them to the different roles in our lives, and this begins to give some clarity. And we look at, the next slide here, specific kinds of behaviors, trying to really break it down here. Specific kind of behaviors that, more, that, that help us achieve our values and our purpose. And so these are just some examples. In terms of loving God at home, specific kinds of behaviors involve like we're going to get in, the, in God's word together as a family. 
we're going to have family devotions. Or loving others at school or work. That might specifically look like, I want to pray. I want to be in prayer. I want to ask them and communicate my care and my love for, for my coworkers by asking, like, hey, how can I be praying for you this week? What kind of needs may be there? Or classmates. Or I show that my, I, my love for God by enjoying his creation and annual adventures, outdoor adventures, by visiting a new state park or national park each year. That's very specific, as you can see. But that can be part of, that's, that's how specific things can become in terms of your family or personal mission vision kinds of things. It becomes intensely practical, and therefore, when things are practical, when things are clear, you know what to do. Oftentimes, we're stalled out in life, and we feel stuck, and we're just going with the flow of our emotions or the impulses that we have or the cultural trends because we don't have the clarity of, like, what's my next step? What am I going to do today? That's where this practice of putting these goals together helps us out. These things, these different practices come into our homes in terms of we do our responsibilities before privileges. This, 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 this is something we, we teach to our kids, right? You get your privileges after you've done your schoolwork, your chores, and this is what we do. As adults, I'm going to delay gratification. Instead of watching that Netflix show at work, I'm going to do my work at work and save that Netflix show for later. Maybe while we're with people, we want to be more present in terms of loving others as we interact with them. So I'm going to turn my notifications off on my phone and my watch so I'm not interrupted and I'm constantly checking my phone. Oh, I gotta, I'm listening. I'm listening to you. I've done this. I've had to. This is specific to me. Where I, where I let my life be intruded and invaded by other people. But you know what? We can communicate love and make people who are with, right in front of us, the most important thing. Turn your notifications off. You don't need to know what people are texting you or think of a response. That's the urgent stuff that's not important, right? Other practices include, if we, want, we, we value togetherness, how can we have a family meal? Do you know the profound transformation? Homes that have family meals, where families sit down to, and have meals together, have, have higher uh, 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 self-esteem, academic success, uh, uh, um, lower rates of depression and suicide, um, and life change, like family meals. Family meals are profoundly transformative. We want to have that practice as a family that values being together and loving each other. Family devotions, church, small group, we've talked about those things. Now, we've got to schedule these things, though, into our lives. Or, excuse me, we have to identify needs. Oftentimes, the, the, our goals can be unrealistic if we don't identify what are the needs involved for me to accomplish this. There might be uh, a certain amount of time that we need, people who need to be part of our life, training, finances, whatever it may be. As I have been able to live free from pornography and still want to live free from pornography, I'm a child of God, I'm loved by God, and I am set free from those patterns, and I want to continue to live in that. There are things I need to accomplish that purpose, that goal. I need men in my life who will hold me accountable. I need software on devices that will help hold me accountable. I need God's word in my mind. I need to be memorizing scripture. I need prayer. I need to be in a place where I'm receiving God's grace in my life so I don't live out of shame because shame's a big trigger for going back to those self-medicating ways. Pornography. These are things that if I don't understand, these are the things I need in order to get victory in my life, I'm not going to be successful in accomplishing that goal. We need to assess those needs. And then we need to schedule these goals. There's daily goals, weekly rhythms, monthly, annually. They need to be scheduled into our lives. We schedule what we value. It's what we do. Schedule what you value. And an example of this is being loved by God. I want to take care of my body by exercising three days a week 
in the morning, before work, and stop eating at 8 p.m. Again, very clear, right? There's a rhythm there. Now, i got to break it down even more. Like, what days of the week? Because, let's be honest, because when I say just three days of the week, it ends up being like one. Unless I say it's going to be happen Monday, Wednesday, Friday. i got to be clear and specific in order to empower me, in order to take action, in order for me to follow through. These are, again, just practical things to help us in our actions aligning with our purpose. As we go forward from here today, the next step I just want to encourage you in terms of application is, if we're going to continue to do this, this isn't a one and done thing, this is a process. The thing I want to encourage you guys to do is set up, schedule, plan a time to plan. Every week, you've got a time where you're gonna take 20 to 30 minutes and you're gonna look at your week. You do that as a family, Maybe that's at a breakfast before school or, 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 or it's Sunday afternoons or it's a supper time. We have a family meal and we're going to talk about the week. What does our week look like this week? How are we going to love God, love others at home and school and work? How are we going to do this, guys? And we talk about it and we look at our schedule. Does our schedule reflect this? Are there some intentional kinds of things that need to change in our schedule? Every week, I want to challenge you. This, if you do anything going forward from today, set that, si- that time aside. Because this little practice of filling out this worksheet and, sheet and using this handout, it's going to take time. Which if you have that weekly time scheduled, then you'll have the time to continue to develop goals together as a family and personally. We need that weekly time. Now, as we come to this moment here, and some of you are feeling like, oh my goodness, this is, feels constricting. This feels overwhelming. This feels unnatural. Like, I'm not a planner. Planning, it, like, sound, like, induces vomiting in me. Like, I am not that person. Like, and it's so much work. And yes, yes. Now, planning is going to look differently among different people. Some of you are, are going to be, you want to be more spontaneous. Plan spontaneity. Plan it. Give yourself permission for that, but you still need to be intentional. You're never going to accomplish your purposes and your goals without intentionality. Your, your planning may not be as meticulous as, uh, as others, where some others, like my brother-in-law, who's here today, and I love him dearly, and he is a great guy, and he loves Excel spreadsheets, and Chris Conrad is known for his Excel spreadsheets, and he plans out his life through Excel spreadsheets, and it's amazing. Yes! Yes! It is a great thing. And he's, he, I actually, and I mention this to him often, like I, I look up to him so much because he's such an intentional person. And I aspire to be that way. It's going to look differently. You don't have to, we're not all going to be Chris Conrad's. And his family's like, amen, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> we're also not all, you know, fly by the seat of your pants hippies. We're all different. The principle is, if we don't plan, we won't experience God's abundance in our life. We need to plan under God's plan. And that's where it comes to our communion today. God's word makes it clear that even though we make our plans, we need to surrender them to the Lord. We, we, make, we have desires and things within our own hearts that don't align with God. Now, planning isn't a bad thing under a sovereign God. Now, these scriptures remind us, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. The heart of man, he plans his own way, but the Lord establishes his steps. God's the one who's in control. Now, some might think like, well, because God's in control, I shouldn't plan. That's not true. That's not true because, again, his word just instructed us we need to plan and diligently do so. We plan because you know what? We are made in God's image. We are all made in God's image. God is a planning God. And so we are made to be planners. But we are made to surrender our plan to his. We need to, as much as we we walk through this exercise, 
we make plans in our day, we still have to have open hands because we don't know what he's doing. We need to surrender always our plan and our way to him. We need to to come to the Lord regularly and say, say, Lord, correct me because my plans and my purposes may be for my own benefit and not for God's glory. It may not be for loving others. It's selfish. And I need him to change me and my plans. As we come to the communion table today, the body and blood of Jesus remind us that Jesus is, came and he changed us. He came to make us right with, the God, with, with God the Father to follow his plan and not our own. He came to break the power of sin in us. Our desire, our impulse, I want my way. I live for me. We need the body and blood of Jesus to work in us and transform us so that we will follow God's purposes and his plans. No matter what kind of intentionality you have, you and I will not follow God's plan, God's ways, without Jesus in our hearts. All these practical things, it's good, but it'll end up controlling you, and you'll corrupt it for your own purposes. It begins with Jesus. We need him in us. We need him cleansing our hearts and our motives. We need his power to make his purpose ours. So as we come to the communion table today, and you'll be coming up, up the, side, uh, um, the side lanes there, and then you can go back through the middle. As we come forward, and as you receive Jesus' broken body for you and his shed blood for you, There's an exchange that's happening here. Jesus, as I receive you taking my penalty and my punishment, I also surrender, not just me living for myself, but Jesus, I surrender my plans. I surrender my sense of purpose. I surrender my control. I surrender my powerlessness. I need you to work in me.